the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you back to episode number 73, where today we are actually talking about two very fundamental mathematical objects and one actually and they're basically the same thing actually they're basically one mathematical <laughs> object no they're not <laughs> i mean one can be used to anyways let me explain it what we're talking about today is sequences and series now this was actually um requested by one of you guys so here we have one of those requested episodes as we keep saying you know go ahead we love those requests because i mean that's you know kind of what builds this up as always and yeah sequences and series for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, this is w- like sequences and series is one of the things that uh, I know. I, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but in high school, we literally spent like a week on sequences and series. Very low amount of and time. And so when I got to university, it was nice to actually get like real exposition into into the topic and actually learn like some theorems. And some some cool things that you can actually do mm-hmm. with sequences and series. Actually, kind of one of my favorite uh, units that we did. What about what about you? Did you? Oh, like, the, did you, you, enjoy you that? thought you found sequences one of your. Yeah. To yeah. be honest, I really enjoyed um, the latter half of the series um, section of it. So when we get into today's episode, we're gonna kind of differentiate between these two terms. If you haven't heard of them before, and if you have, then you will know a little bit about series and you may know some famous series and in the end of our particular class we had some really nice or at least the way they taught it i really enjoyed learning about those series and seeing you know where they can happen and apply in real life like taylor series power series stuff like that okay yeah yeah yeah. like those are the examples that i wanted to give but yeah more on the series side but um not one of my okay i don't want to say no i mean all of them i enjoyed them (laughs) but uh not favorite but i like it i like it because it's another way of making a scenario into a discrete scenario so a lot a lot of sequences and series actually revolves around discrete mathematics we were thinking about the type of episode that was going to happen today so sequences and series are basically forms of discrete mathematics and discrete mathematics is synonymous with finite mathematics now Yes, there are some infinite series and stuff like that, I know. But the main essence of a lot of this applies in discrete mathematics, right? And a lot of it, and in discrete mathematics is where we really see the connection between the real world and math, right? Because a lot of in in continuous functions and a lot of those things are like, okay, well, is it really this? Not really, you know, stuff like that. Like they're more examples. Wait, what do you mean by that? (laughs) Well, when it comes to like a continuous function, for example, like I'm just trying to think when you have discrete, you know, numbers, discrete variables, you have a better understanding of it. It's a smaller subset and there's more things you can do with it. Right. But the thing is, um, you said that like continuous math is more connected to the real world. But no, I said I think there's connected. Well, I think I think they're both equally applicable I mean, okay, right because there are always situations where you uh, where you need to use one over the other or you know vice versa no that's right that that, that is that does hold point for sure because continuous math i shouldn't really say that but i just wanted to point out that discrete mathematics is really cool and okay maybe not more applicable but is applicable to the real mm-hmm. world and we're gonna okay. talk a little bit about that but i also i also don't understand when you say it's synonymous to finite math yeah like why why is it finite what do you mean because like sequences are like infinite right they just they range over the natural numbers but still infinite what makes it finite so usually when we're dealing with uh i guess that's also true but usually when we're dealing with discrete mathematics i was um finite finite math and discrete math are very similar in the sense that you know the the math that applies to both of them you you like you can use them in both scenarios is mm. what i'm trying to say now that's what i was saying even when i was giving those examples of the series right like for example like you know taylor series power like a lot of them are infinite series so 
I know it kind of kind of goes against the whole finite thing that I was trying to say, but I do I do know for a fact that somewhere there is a connection between discrete and finite math, and just that connection. I just wanted to let people know about the fact that that connection exists. Oh right? wait, I actually have the Wikipedia page open here. It says Go that for it. Um, it's also called finite math okay. because sometimes it's applied like in some fields of discrete math it deals with finite sets and ah so okay what, so yeah. finite okay so discrete is not synonymous but finite is like a part of discrete mathematics that would that would make a little more sense yeah and i guess yeah. i can mention just for the listeners out there like discrete math like today we're going we're to be talking about sequences and series as you know but discrete math deals with objects like the integers graphs statements in logic and such things like that you know that are that are not continuous essentially you know what i mean mm -hmm. so uh yeah before we get into yes sequences and series let's get into news let's hit them with a little bit of news let's hit them with so it. first of all thank you so much everybody for 186,000 downloads in wow. total also one other piece of news i actually have two exciting pieces of news first off we literally got, like this week, we got 140 subscribers in one week on YouTube, which is, which is and, nice. And we have 1.14 nice. Yeah, <laughs> we have 1,140. <laughs> so. Okay, exactly. So yeah, like the cool. 140 is a big number for the number of subscribers yeah. that we have. Yeah, Definitely, definitely. So keep subscribing to the YouTube <laughs> if you haven't already. Yep. Um, other than that, here's something that was pretty cool to see so i haven't checked google play statistics since like five months ago and like five months ago i checked google play and we'd have like 10 followers so i was like okay i don't really have to like check this anymore because we've been doing the podcast for almost a year and mm -hmm. we have 10 followers like whatever but I got an email from Google Play a couple of days ago. So I was like, I, I'll just go check the statistics. <laughs> and I discovered that we have 2,000 followers on Google Play. So that's cool. That's cool, <laughs> thank you, I guess. That's thank cool. You to, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to everybody that's been listening on Google Play. Mm -hmm. We will no longer be ignoring you guys. But uh, other than Google Play, we have hit 12,000 <laughs> followers on Spotify. So thank you once again. I don't think we posted about it, but we we hit twelve thousand. So wow, yeah. very nice, very yeah, nice. Yeah, those thousand milestones are pretty impressive. I mean, I guess now we're going for the now we're now let's go for the five thousand milestones. So now fifteen is where we're at, and then maybe twenty, mm. you know, twenty. So I guess yeah. I guess maybe we can make those popular instead of the one, you know. Yeah. Now that you guys are subscribing, following, so awesome. Obviously, as all. As, as always, you know, continue doing that. Continue liking that video for the algorithm, commenting, you know, trying to get that. That algorithm is, is the reason we're here, right? <laughs> so moving on to the other segment, the comment of the week. Now, it's very simple. If you must be wondering to yourself, how do I become the comment of the week? Well, it's very simple. Just comment on this week's episode. That's it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And then it's just kind of like a random pick that Parker and I do, whoever's up. And that's the comment of the week. So this week, we have Grat. Now, that's his YouTube name. So again, not sure of his whole name, actually. But Grat says, hey, guys, I'm a sophomore at University of Alabama studying aerospace engineering. And this podcast has allowed me to learn so much more about complicated physics, such as quantum mechanics, that I cannot thank you all enough. The discussion is always so entertaining, so educational that I believe you guys are doing a perfect job. Keep up the great work, and I cannot wait until next week's podcast. Sweet. So thank you, Grat, for that wonderful comment. And hopefully, if you're listening to this, well, comment of the week. What's uh, what's sophomore? Is it second? So it's freshman, sophomore, freshman, junior, sophomore? senior, okay, so yeah. second year. Yeah, for sure. that would be second year. Awesome. Yep. Let's get so, into it. Um, Let's get okay. into... Let's go. Boom. Sequences. So a sequence, essentially, the definition of a sequence is very loose. It's, you know, it's it's just a set of numbers, essentially. That has some pattern to it. Some not necessarily. No, not, not even. Not even? Well, usually sequences, 
Well, yeah, because every sequence can be written in terms of... Okay, so I want to get into one important thing before we get into this because we're talking about this. So a sequence, you were saying, is basically a list of numbers. Now, you may be thinking, a list of numbers? Where have I heard these guys say that before? Sets. But sets also come in very important somewhere in a function. Sets are literally how we define functions. What functions do is they take sets and they mount and they're basically they change it up. So here's what I wanted to say about, about this whole thing. So we have a sequence that is basically a set of numbers. Now, the reason why I was saying that it has to have some order because every sequence can be written as a function of n. That's not true. Is, was, is that not true? I thought that was true. No. Every sequence cannot be written as a function of the number at the no, element of the sequence. No, it's not true. Like, just a general sequence can literally be a list of just random, random numbers. numbers. Just like a set, yeah. basically. Just a yeah. set. Yeah, yeah literally. Um, okay. But, you know, just like functions. Functions don't have to be nice. They just have to no, mount but they have, numbers. but they have some, but it's a function of X is what I'm trying to say. No, so there's no, some relationship even. between the variables. No, but Ray, so think is there, about it. Yeah. Think about it for one second. Remember how you can define a function as like, it's equal to one on the rational numbers equal yeah. to zero. Like you can define a function with words. You can also define a function by literally one by one list, like listing every or sorry, associating every real number with another real number. And that will also be a function. The same thing with sequences. You can just associate every natural number to another number randomly, and it'll still count as a sequence. Okay. It doesn't have to follow any pattern. But, of course, you know, we're, <laughs> those aren't really useful, right? So the sequences that we look at are sequences like, mm -hmm. you know, that are associated to functions or that are defined like the Fibonacci sequence, mm -hmm. things like that. But well, well, before we really get, cause, cause we've defined kind of, okay, a sequence is a set of numbers, but let's try to maybe differentiate a little bit between the sequence and the function, right? Mm -hmm. Because the function and like, because again, when, when we just say set of numbers, it can be taken as a, but it's not exactly. Right, so like a the 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 main difference, well, is that a function takes in a variable, and it spits out something. So it has a relationship between x and y, which are our two variables, right? And it has multiple points. In this case, I'm just talking about a two D function, so just one input, one output, very simple, That's right? Cool. Sorry. That's a one dimensional. Well, yeah, one, but I'm trying to say like two, gra like graph. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's what I'm saying. So like one input, one output kind of function. So it's super simple and it's kind of like pairs almost, right? So it's like one number associated with something else. And in a sequence, again, we're talking about the interesting ones. So the ones that can actually be written as of. So when we say that the main difference is what. So, okay, let me try. And let me, I'm just trying to think of it and a nice way to say it. We say a function of x, and x and y are related. When we do a sequence, it's a function of the of the of the element. You know how am I trying to say this? Like of where it is in the sequence, right? So every sequence, let's say it's one to ten, every element of that sequence will have a number. So the second, so two is the second term of the sequence. Eight is the eighth term of the sequence. So that number that I'm referring to is n. Right? So mm -hmm. seven is the seventh term. Ten is the tenth term of the sequence. So like the cardinality or is that what it's called? Is that what it's called? I have forgotten. Like the, a the, bit. the order of which. Yeah, ordered, is... obvious. But I'm saying like that N, again, I'm kind of forgetting what that, like a like a nice way to say it if it's already defined technically. Oh, the speaking. indice? Index. The index of the sequence index, would index, be a yeah. nice way to dis uh, define it. Yes. So the position of that, of that but element. i don't know why you're why you're saying it's so complicated though like, the reason i'm okay i think i did overcomplicate it but the point that i was trying to make is that a function is a function of the variable while a sequence is a function of the index so that's just that differentiation that i wanted to put out because f it's very similar Right, because if you think about it a sequence and a function are basically the same thing because you can write 
a formula, like an equation for a sequence, right? For the nth term of the sequence. And in the same way, you can write a formula for a function. So a y term that correlates with some given x. So I just wanted to point out the fact that they're so similar, this is the function and the sequence, but they're also different because technically they are depending on different values, right? I just want to kind of bring that similarity and that distinguishing between <laughs> the sequence and the function. The, I don't mean to like rag on your explanation, but I really don't like how you said it. <laughs> you don't like the function uh, indices no. definition? Let me, no, let me so, hear how you would do it. Well, how I would say... I would yeah. be like, okay, well, a function, you know, just like a simple one dimensional function is defined over the real numbers and a sequence is defined over the natural numbers. That's it. So if you graph a function, you know, it's like a nice function, it's smooth and whatever. And when you graph a sequence, it's just like dots that appear over. The yeah, but you can numbers. also have a discrete function. You can also have a piecewise, fun you know, stuff like that. Like, yeah, I, I guess so. Depending on your on your uh, domain so that's what i'm saying so i'm just trying to because because a because you're talking about the general function definition so yeah obviously they're different because a function can be continuous right and a a sequence simply inherently cannot so there's that number one difference of course between them but i'm talking about a discrete function versus something like a discrete it's like i'm just trying to again pull out the similarities and the differences right just to understand well what is the relationship between these two things sure right um but yeah, sequences obviously are not <laughs> continuous. They mm-hmm. they range over the natural numbers, which means it's like, okay, the first element is when you plug in one. Or sometimes you, you can start with the first element is when you plug in zero. But it, it's kind of like, um, tra- not tradition. What's the word I'm looking for? Like the norm, I guess. The norm is to usually start at zero. But if your if your sequence is, for example, like one over n, then you're gonna start n at one and then to infinity, for example. And that's just because, you know, obviously you can't divide by zero. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing about sequences is that they have certain properties that can be analyzed. First property is the boundedness. Okay. So since sequences start at some point, right, whether it, it's one or zero or anything, uh, that, let's say your, your sequence is strictly increasing. It's always increasing. That means the lowest bound that it, or the lowest value that your sequence will ever hit is the very first element, mm-hmm. I guess. Do mm-hmm. we call them elements? Whatever. Yeah, yeah, um, element of the sequence, yeah. Yeah, so the the... That's the first thing. It, it, it's, it could be bounded below or above. Um, but one thing that's really important is the monotonicity. Mm. So monotonic means that it's either strictly increasing, strictly decreasing, or non-increasing, non-decreasing. Maybe explain so that. Yeah. The difference between those terms. Yeah. So if, if a sequence is increasing then the next term, like every next term, has to be bigger than the last. If a function is non-decreasing, it means that the, the values can't get smaller. And there is a difference. The only difference is that when a function is non-decreasing, you can have like one number be one and the next one is also one. But then it can go to like two and then two again and two mm-hmm. again. Uh, but it, it just can't go down. It can stay the same. It can go up, but it can't go down. And it's the exact <laughs> opposite for decreasing or non-increasing. But there's still that little difference there. So that's like if, you're, if your sequence has that property, that it's one of those four things, then it's monotonic. And so we have last two terms that we have to introduce. Mm-hmm. is uh, the convergence, okay? So a uh, sequence can either converge or diverge. It's a big one. This means that if you look at the behavior of your sequence as the terms go to infinity or the numbers that you plug in go to infinity, um, does it tend to a single value 
or does it alternate like does it oscillate does it go to infinity does it go to minus infinity or anything like that so if the limit does exist and it equals some real number then it is convergent if your sequence oscillates or blows up to infinity or minus infinity then it diverges and so those are pretty much like the big the big properties mm-hmm. of sequences that you so like s- study maybe yeah. it's like some common examples right so like for a diverging is easiest as a sine or a cosine like a trigonometric function or like a trigonometric sequence mm-hmm. right because that would be continuously oscillating between values of one and negative one right provided there's no stretch squeeze factor it's basically just oscillating between those values and no matter how far we go into the sequence we're never really going to find something that is converging to words right and this is a cool property now this is maybe where my function definition might help a property of sequences is actually comparing them to a function so let's say let me try and like maybe break this down even easier for people that maybe didn't understand that full explanation just to make it super simple. So like an example of a function can be f of x equals 1 over x, right? That's basically where you put in an x and it will spit out an f value, like a y value basically, 1 over whatever that was. Now with a sequence, it's the exact same thing. In this case, instead of x, it'll be n, where n represents, again, just variables, dummy variables, doesn't really matter. It's just so we can understand, but n represents the index of the sequence. So in this case, f of n would be 1 over n. So I've just compared that a function, 1 over x, and a sequence, 1 over n, can be directly compared. So talking about convergence and divergence and all this good stuff, a property of these sequences is obviously there is a mathematical statement behind it that I'm not going to get into, just a very loose way of describing it. But if a sequence, or not if a sequence, but the formula of that sequence, put it into a function, basically have the same function as that sequence, take the limit of the function as x approaches infinity, and that will be the limit of your sequence. And this would apply if it diverges, if it converges, or if it approaches a singular number. The theorem is actually only if it approaches a singular number, because I believe if it diverges, there can be some other things that happen, but this is basically Mm. the formal way of saying it. I think you're thinking about the series, like the the theorem about the series, not the sequence, because the sequence, you can take a limit of a sequence. You don't have to make it a function, right? You can just take the limit of a sub n, you know what I mean? Well, but we were talking about sequences converging and diverging. So I'm talking about taking that limit of the sequence. So if you don't know if it's converging or diverging. But why do you have to make it a function though? Why can't you just take the limit? Because you don't, what do you mean? No, I'm saying that's we, that's exactly what we do though, right? What do we do? We make it into a function is what we exactly do. Because when we write down the formula of the sequence and we take the limit as n approaches infinity, what is that? But you can take a limit of a sequence, though. Yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say again. (laughs) I'm just trying to make the comparison again. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to explain. I'm just trying to make the comparison between functions and sequences. And the fact that they're so similar is all I'm trying to say. So the same limit that you take with a a sequence is the same limit that you take with a function. And yes, this this applies in sequences, but this was the theorem that I was reading. I can read it out directly. Given given a sequence a n, if we have a function f of x such that f of n equals a n and limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals l, then the limit as n approaches infinity of a n equals l, which is very straightforward. It's very straightforward. My only question is why. (laughs) No, very, very obvious statement. I just wanted to make it out so that, again, people are just more used to the idea of functions and sequences being synonymous, right? I just wanted to pull that up because you were talking about... to each other. Yeah, to each other. Because you were talking about the whole uh, convergence and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... We have the monotonic convergence theorem, which if you, th- if you take like two seconds to think about what it says, it's very obvious. Very, very obvious. I, I love how we say that because we already <laughs> know it. But to so many people listening, they're no, like, no. no, this is just not obvious. <laughs> no, but if you just take two seconds, you, okay, explain you'll it. be let's like, see, okay, let's see. Here it let, is, here let's it. see the exp- okay. Let's hear it. So if your <clears throat> sequence is monotonic and bounded 
then it converges. Okay, so let's just take two seconds here to think about it. So bounded uh, inherently means, you know, bounded above and below, meaning that there are definitely two values within which your sequence stays, okay? Second thing, it's monotonic. Or actually, sorry, in the monotonic convergence theorem, it says your sequence has to be eventually monotonic. This just means that there is a point at which, you know, every single uh, number past that point is strictly decreasing, strictly increasing, mm -hmm. or non-increasing or non-decreasing, <clears throat> okay? But remember, you still have that bounded property, which means that it doesn't really matter what happens before that point where it's monotonic, because you still know that it's bounded. Yeah. But, boom, you know it's either strictly increasing, but it's still bounded, which means that, you know, it kind of looks like uh, one of those 1 over x situations where, you know, every value keeps going down, getting closer and closer to that lower bound or upper bound. It could be flipped, but... Um, Mm -hmm. it, it has to continue to decrease because you know it's monotonic but you also know that it's bounded which means that it, you know it gets closer and closer to one value meaning that it converges boom monotonic convergence theorem. C. very another, useful oh very useful but very useful yeah very useful another another kind of consequence of that is well the other way around right if it's monotonic and non-bounded like if it's not bounded above so for example let's say it's monotonic so like let's say it's eventually increasing and it's not bounded above or it's eventually decreasing and it's not bounded below in both of those scenarios this limit will go to infinity right so it basically diverges mm -hmm. right because there's no bound so again i totally understand what you mean once you explain it because again it's very obvious once you you're just like oh yeah well it doesn't have a bound on the top and it's always increasing so obviously it's going to go to infinity Right. Mm -hmm. So that could be like an obvious thing of the MTC, right, which is a very popular. It's, it's basically like a way to test for convergence. Right. A lot of a lot of what we do in uh, sequences and series is ways to test said sequence, said series. And I think in series is really where they're all the crazy tests. Right. Alternate all that. Yeah. All those crazy tests are in the series and we're going to get to that. But again, what will this allow us to do? This will allow us again to to basically to, to conclude if this thing converges or not. And if it converges, big advantages, very, very big advantages. Let me explain. So properties of converging sequences are, well, almost, I think, yeah, well, they are almost identical to that of just variables. So like limit as the sequence goes to infinity of A plus B, where A and B are two sequences, you can just take them separately. You can add the limit separately if they're converging. They're linear. Linear. Well, oh, they're linear. They're the, there's the multiplication uh, rule. There are all of these rules that apply if they mm -hmm. are convergent. So again, the point of all of this is basically to test for convergence. And then once we have that, we can make a conclusion based on another sequence or adding another sequence and stuff like that. Right? So there are a lot of advantages and Again, because of the relationship between sequences and all these things, you can even apply rules that apply to functions on sequences, like the squeeze theorem, for example, right? So just like different things, again, just applying onto these, right, 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 exactly. So yeah. if you had, do you have something to say? I think, I think what you said a little bit earlier was for series. Oh, did like I mean when you say, what when I you say? say you can add them together, because if you have two sequences, you can always add two sequences together. This, it doesn't have to be convergent or anything, right? But if you want to add two series together, then they have to be convergent. Or if you want to multiply a series by a, a constant, then it has to be convergent for it to actually mean anything, right? Um, so not exactly. Because if they're non-convergent sequences, you can't add them. Why? Because what they're adding is not the sequence itself. They're okay. So the property is with the limit of the sequence. I probably I, I don't know if I stressed okay, that. Yeah, you didn't yes. say that. I didn't say that. Sorry. No. The prop this whole property is with the limit of all of these sequences. So the yeah. limit of the addition of two of of so basically the 
again, when I say limit, I'm basically saying, what is that converging number? What is it converging to? So limit of as n approaches infinity of a plus b can be split up into limit as n approaches infinity of a plus limit as n approaches infinity of b provided a and b are convergent sequences. And this applies for multiplication. This applies for division, power, all of them. So again, it's just a fancy, helpful way to kind of provide these two um, sequences together, right? So that's why, again, just again, honing in on the importance of convergence is basically where I'm getting, right? That's mm -hmm. basically the point of this. Mm -hmm. Anything with sequences? Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about the big theorem. Oh, yes, because, yes, yes. Talk about that the, first. Yeah. Talk the about big that theorem is used in order to tell if a sequence converges or diverges just at a glance. Glance. Just at a yeah. glance. It's very, it's a very nice <laughs> theorem. Okay. And so this theorem uh, uh, is used uh, for in the limit when you're looking at very, very large n that you're plugging into the function. And, um, you know, this is, when we talk about sequences, the only thing we're actually doing is looking, testing for convergence, looking at limits and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that, you know, this theorem is useful because it only matters in the limit as n goes to infinity. So here's a theorem. So the natural log of n is much smaller than n to the power of a constant which is much smaller than a constant to the power of n which is much smaller than n factorial which is much smaller than n to the power of n okay now why is this useful okay this is useful because let's say your let's take an easy example let's say your sequence is the natural log of n divided by n factorial now by the big <laughs> theorem n factorial is much 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 bigger than the natural log of n which means that you already know that in the limit it goes to zero um but you can obviously have very very complicated sequences with lots and lots of terms and all that stuff and you can actually use the big theorem to reduce that complicatedness to something much simpler and then you could easily tell well okay boom it converges or it diverges for example let's say you have like a, a whole mix of a bunch of factorial terms a whole bunch of like powers and all that stuff you can actually just replace terms so that they cancel out on purpose for example or actually this has to do this has a lot to do with um with uh what we're going to talk about in series but let's say you have like uh the natural log of n times n factorial divided by uh wait this is actually not a good idea <laughs> this is not a good idea <laughs> on the spot you're trying to think about how it's no work. no no it's, it's not about thinking about the example it's the fact that I would need like a piece of paper to, to write it down do it. So, pe so people can actually see. Like imagining this in your head is not a good idea. But but I think I think people get, get the, the idea of what you were yeah, trying you to say. You get the though. idea. You, if you know it, that yeah. something is much bigger than something else, mm -hmm. then you can simplify things down so that in the end you can say, <coughs> okay, you have something that's really big, so it diverges. Or it becomes very, very small, so it converges. Things like that. Mm -hmm. That's basically the big, right? And again, another way of testing for convergence, right? Just mm -hmm. seeing about uh, like testing the main property of sequences that we're trying to see. So before we move on a series, I wanted to talk about one particular sequence that's pretty cool. The Fibonacci sequence. Now, the Fibonacci sequence is a very, very popular one where it basically relates the addition of the two previous numbers to the next one, right? So what does that mean? It starts with zero. The first Fibonacci number is zero, and the second Fibonacci is one. And all preceding Fibonacci numbers are, it's, it's, it's a formula, it's a sequence. Succeeding. It's a succeeding, it's, yeah. Basically, it's, there's not a constant linear gap between each 
each uh, each two term, uh, each two numbers, each two elements of the sequence. So it's basically just numbers. And what's happening is first two elements are zero and one. And this is the formula for the sequence. Fn equals Fn minus one plus Fn minus two. Let me explain. So I already said that F1 and F2 are zero and one, right? Like our first Fibonacci is zero, second one is one. That's set in stone. And then we're starting from there. So the next Fibonacci number given by this formula is basically one plus zero. So we have one. Next. One plus one. We have two. Next. Two plus one. We have three. You, you, you kind of see where this is going? So the whole idea of the Fibonacci sequence is basically just adding these two successive numbers before and seeing what we get as the next term. Now, to an average individual, and actually me myself as well, when I originally <clears throat> read on this, but I'm like, why? What's so, what's so cool in these numbers? Well, quite a few things actually. Well, there are a lot of cool properties of it. The very first thing is that a lot of these numbers are seen everywhere. That means like in algebra and engineering and mathematics, when we're dealing with, you know, building things, artistry, a lot of it, we see these numbers. Now, again, concrete examples are different, but I'm going to be, we're going to be talking a little bit about it. And I want to get into where it can get really cool. But again, the whole point of the Fibonacci sequence is that there is this sequence that holds, again, it's just a random sequence. It's just one type of sequence. But why is it important? Well, two things, actually many things. The first thing is that it converges to the golden ratio. Now, the golden ratio, may have, people may have heard of that term, may have heard of that number, 1.618, right? Right? Some of that. Right? 1.618, right? Six, wait, I'm forgetting. one, I think. Six, I don't know. Wait, I don't know. Some, <laughs> some, some number, basically. Some number. And the property on, on the but idea... It's actually, wait, hold on. One, one little detail. It's actually the ratio of the Fibonacci number over the previous one goes to the golden ratio not the that actual limit approaches yeah. it but no no you no, just no. said the but, sequence no, no. goes it to does that. though it does the fibonacci sequence converges to phi which is the golden ratio well the ratio converges to phi the fibonacci sequence goes to infinity the ratio goes to phi well I mean, oh, that way. Well, yes. Well, obviously, right? Because you're ever increasing your number and you yeah. have no bound on this. So I know. But it's you said the, oh, that's what you, you meant. You said that's the what sequence goes to infinity. Yeah, I, right, I, I'm like, fine. wait, am I just completely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Well, the whole point of the golden ratio is taking ratios of terms. So you're basically taking the ratio of sides, of lengths, and stuff like that. So quick disclaimer to those of you that have probably or maybe not have heard of this term before. So the golden ratio is basically this number, which is basically a ratio of two of any two things where I don't even know if there's a solid definition for it, but it's basically to, to human eyes, it's aesthetically pleasing anything that follows that ratio. So let me give you the simplest example, the rule of thirds in a photograph, you know how you're supposed to be on one third of the photo, like that rule is from the golden ratio. Let me explain. So the golden ratio, I can give you like an example, and this is the example that I read off online, may make sense to some of you. We take a line segment and we cut it such that there's a long piece and there's a short piece. The ratio of the whole line segment to the long piece is the same as the ratio of the long piece to the shorter piece. And that ratio is the golden ratio. That mm -hmm. number is the golden ratio. And this is seen everywhere. This can be seen in these examples. And interestingly enough, the very first, again, I believe I could be wrong here, but I believe the very first true uh, use, at least to humanity, like really seeing it and really enjoying it, of the golden ratio was via Leonardo da Vinci in his art, in his paintings. He actually used, and I believe he's also the one that coined the, the phi, the Greek phi term, mm -hmm for that particular ratio that basically described, again, just his details, his, again, I, not that I know anything about art, <laughs> but like his, his art conformed with the golden ratio, the size, the, what was, wh what was where, the 
the, the area the that each imp- the portions exactly the area that each you know part of the part of the painting takes all that good stuff conform with this ratio so anyways all of this to basically say the fibonacci sequence this random sequence is not actually that random and it's actually pretty cool and i wanted to bring out some really cool properties of such a sequence that i would i would just i was just reading these out and we oh, parker and i were like wait that's crazy <laughs> yeah you just to be explicit by the yes. way the golden ratio is equal to it's one plus root five all divided by two that's what it's equal to. Well, yeah, that's the formula. And it's actually yeah. got from the Fibonacci sequence. So you really? can actually derive it. You can get it from the Fibonacci sequence the way that it's, uh, the way that it's made. Because, again, the whole that's point of the Fibonacci sequence is the ratio converges to the goal. But how ratio. do you get to that number? Though? Again, like, that's, that's, a math, that's, a, that's a very mathematical yeah. thing. But we can definitely do it, right? I mean, why not? We can always have fun with that. So some cool things, some cool properties that I wanted to read out that I just that is read on this sequence. And anyways, if you if you're hearing for Fibonacci sequences for the very first time, you can maybe search it up or maybe just hear these properties out. So the sum of any 10 consecutive Fibonacci numbers is divisible by 11. Damn. <laughs> any 10. I just think that's cool. I just, that's a cool property. Then um, this is really cool. Two consecutive Fibonacci numbers do not have any common factor. Which means they are co-prime or relatively prime or close prime numbers, right? It doesn't have to be co-prime numbers, uh, but they're relatively close prime numbers. So that's also a cool thing. Um, this was really interesting as well. Again, I'm just reading it off of this page. You can definitely, I mean, for those viewers out there, you can definitely see me kind of. The sum of the first n Fibonacci numbers is equal to the Fibonacci number two further along the sequence minus one. Mm-hmm. What that basically means is. If we're taking, well, let's say let's say n is 5. So we're doing f1 plus f2 plus f3 to 5. So we're adding the first five Fibonacci numbers. That would, e- if you don't know what that equals, that simply equals f7 minus 1. But that's so cool. I guess I you'd have to so know cool. what f7 equals. Yeah, well, we would have to. <laughs> exactly, right? So you would have to know. So there's always some kind of thing with this because this is actually, actually, we didn't even talk about this. The one type of sequence or this type of sequence where it depends on the previous term. And mm-hmm. this is a very, fa- like these are very famous type of sequences, right? We're mainly used to the sequence that's kind of in terms of a function. Like you can write it F of X or F of N or something like that. But in a lot of these cases, Fibonacci sequence is an example. That's not the case. It's not really a function of anything, but well, I mean, it's a function of the previous terms in the sequence, you know, which is mm-hmm. very, which is very different from what we're what we're generally used to right i think that was a main cool thing and obviously the golden ratio thing i mean that's i mean that's the whole point and the whole craziness of the fibonacci sequence and also just talking about you know how important this ratio is just with just with stuff we see in the world right so mm-hmm. i just wanted to put that out there because the fibonacci sequence is really cool and we're talking about sequences so if anyone wants to search it up go ahead i wanted to let you yeah. know <laughs> also like one last thing yeah uh if you have like a piece of paper the the sides are golden ratioed (laughs) if you take like the the big side or the small side divided by no sorry big side divided by the small side Mm -hmm. you get the golden ratio and what that means is that if you fold the piece of paper in half it'll have the same dimensions like relative to the original piece of paper. And mm-hmm. you can do that an infinite amount of times. If you keep folding it, it'll still have like short side yep. or big side divided by short side. You'll still get the golden ratio. And um, this is that famous golden ratio thing. So again, whoever has heard of the term golden ratio has definitely seen that spiral. Yeah. So if you fold your piece of paper like that and unfold it and will connect the dots, you would get that spiral. Damn. <laughs> that's the whole point of it and i i just love how it's so beautiful because again the whole point of this is that it is it is in fact appearing a lot in nature right it just exists a lot now there's definitely a reason do you know the reason i don't know the reason like the real reason why does i don't may, may, there definitely is i am currently not aware of that reason um but it would definitely be a, a very worth it Google search for, or I don't even know if it can be done with one simple one, but definitely, you know, consecutive stuff. I don't but, know uh, about, the, uh, about 
the reason. Maybe there isn't. I don't think there's a reason. I, I don't think, think it's there just is like, a reason. It's just, I just think it's it just is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. Exactly. It is what it is. So, well, that was sequences. <laughs> we really 45 minutes in, haven't started series. <laughs> All right. I mean, there's not that now. much to say on series, but um, it is a it is a type of sequence. Uh, so okay, no. <laughs> so let's let's do it. Continue, so continue. essentially, first thing we gotta know is sigma notation. Oh yes. So sigma notation it, it just means that you know you have you're ranging from some number to some number, and what you do is you add up all the terms. So let's say you're going from n equals one to five and you're summing up n mm -hmm. so what you're going to do is you're going to do one plus two plus three plus four plus five so you're ranging through those indices um how do we use sigma notation for series essentially what you do is what you plug into the summation is a sequence so let's say we have a sequence a sub n and that's equal to whatever n squared then the series is going to be well you know the interesting series are infinite series which is where you go from some index all the way to infinity mm -hmm. and so when you sum an infinite amount of terms obviously the things that we're going to be looking for is convergence <coughs> and divergence mm -hmm. so first of all i have a couple of things to say and some of these things are very logical. If you maybe think explain about it. convergence, divergence in terms of series too, because that's yeah. a little. It's different. very simple, very simple. So simple but if, different. Yeah. If a series converges, then it equals a number. Okay. If it diverges, then it goes to infinity. It goes to negative infinity, or it oscillates. And how how does it oscillate? You may ask. Well, for example, this is the the famous oscillating case is, okay, so you have the, the summation from, let's say, n equals 1 to infinity. And your sequence that you're plugging in is minus 1, in parenthesis, to the power of n. So when n is even, then you're adding 1. And when n is odd, you're adding minus 1. Oh, you're subtracting. Exactly. And... So your series goes one zero one zero one zero one zero one zero. So obviously your infinite or one negative series. One. Well, a series is the summation, right? So if you start with one, oh, you're doing one and minus one only. Okay, yeah. okay. So the, okay. I'm saying the value of the of the series yeah, is yeah, yeah. one zero one zero. Yeah. And so if you're summing this up infinitely, it doesn't converge to any number because it keeps alternating between one and zero. Mm -hmm. So that's one case. And of course, you know, you can have infinity minus infinity. Uh, so converging or convergence is the thing that we look for yep. in series. Now, if you think about it for two seconds. <laughs> Just two seconds, bro. Be, I don't think it, anyone is thinking about anything in two seconds. <laughs> it should be quite obvious that in order for a series to converge, the sequence that you're summing up has to converge to zero. Because if you think about it, if it converges to anything other than zero, then the terms that you're adding an infinite amount of times are, you know, it doesn't matter if they're increasing or, de or decreasing, but you're adding something that's not zero an infinite amount of times. So the, the value just keeps growing, whether it be positive or negative, right? Let's say your mm -hmm. sequence converges to three. Eventually, you're going to be adding numbers that are really close to three, but infinitely. <laughs> if you want your series to converge to an actual number, you need that, you know, when you get to a very high index, you're adding smaller and smaller amounts so that eventually you end up as n goes to infinity, you actually end up with a value and it doesn't explode. Um, something mm -hmm. really interesting, though, about series is that you have something called conditional convergence, Ooh, which yes. is very confusing. Yes. Right? You know how 
I just I just said, you know, it could converge or it could diverge. You know, makes sense. It can equal a number or it could not equal a number. It could equal infinity, whatever. Mm -hmm. But conditional convergence is especially confusing because it makes so little sense <laughs> when you first learn it. And here's what it means. It me essentially, it means, okay, your series converges sometimes. That's literally what it means. <laughs> For example, the harmonic series is conditionally convergent um the harmonic series is, is one it? over n so you're mm -hmm. adding one plus one half plus one third plus one quarter so on mm -hmm. you would expect at a glance maybe this equals some number right because you're adding numbers that are getting smaller and smaller but it can actually be proven that it does not converge but if you actually rearrange the order in which you add the terms, it can converge. Which is why we we say it's conditionally convergent. Mm -hmm. Because order yeah. order is a big thing. Confusing. Very confusing. Def I know. I I mean I remember learning some. I, I mean I remember learning this when we were doing this, and it was not straightforward it was not the obvious two second thing that we learned unfortunately but <laughs> it definitely um gives you a little bit to think about because that convergence again just makes it a little more a little tighter but there are also tests in series to see if something were to converge or diverge right there are a lot of tests actually or we can maybe do the big ones right the bct the alternating and the integral test Right? Am I missing anyone from the big three? Those are the big three, right? Uh, wait. I just actually remembered. Okay. That there's one thing that I didn't write down, but I'm pretty sure you have. Like, there's no way you don't remember this. Um, it's it's a test where you do like. Uh, or actually, this might be the ratio test. Oh, the I ratio test. Oh, we didn't talk about the ratio test. Yeah, no, I think I think I was thinking of the ratio test, but I feel like there's one that I'm missing, but I can't remember which one it is. But whatever, we'll just uh, we'll just say these ones. We can just continue. Yeah, yeah, we can just we can just I guess sum up the big ones, and because the I mean yeah, I don't remember any other one either. Maybe we can just start with these, right? Maybe we can just start with these. So the very first one is, uh, well, we can start with a limit comparison test, right? The limit comparison test, again, just ways to test if these things are convergent, divergent, and again, basically to see, to conclude convergence. And then with that convergence, again, we have all those properties that we can use, right? And that's, again, the main purpose. The main purpose is to test for this, and then we use those properties. So what is the limit comparison test? So it's super simple. Um, I'm just trying to see, because we have A here, just trying to fully get that explanation down. The whole point of the limit comparison test, right, is that you have you have these two sequences. You have F and you have G, or technically you have series. You have two series, you have F, you have G. And you're, again, representing them as functions. The whole point of this is, again, you're representing these sequences as functions. And then with these functions, we already have, we already know some properties, some crazy things that we can, you know, fiddle around with these functions and figure some stuff out. So, well, what does it do? Very, very simple. So we make the sequence into a, again, we're using these function definitions again. We have these two sequences and we're basically saying, well, we're trying to compare them and we're trying to see, well, are these two sequences convergent or divergent? Right, So this is a way to compare these two sequences. And let me explain the limit comparison test in the best way possible. We have two, again, these functions. We're basically taking the limit as x approaches infinity of the quotient of these two functions. And what that gets us is, again, to see if one of them is blowing up or the other is going to zero or the other blowing up one's going to, you know what I mean? So if, if any of that happens, that limit will not exist immediately, right? If G, if G goes to, if, if G blows up, that limit won't exist. If F blows up, that won't exist. If F goes to zero, that won't, you know what I mean? So if 
oh, well, won't exist, I mean greater than zero. It must be greater than zero, which is, again, the other stipulation, right? So if f goes to zero, this doesn't work either. So if the limit exists and it is greater than zero, that's the whole, that's the whole comparison, then the, um, what am I trying to say? The series, both of the series are either both convergent or both divergent. That's a cool one right there. So we have two sequences. We put them together. We find the limit. We see if this limit of the sequences exist. If this limit actually exists and is greater than zero, then we can say that either both of them converge or both of them diverge. Now, an advantage of something or having something like this is given a particular sequence, if we, let's say, don't know if, let's say we have two sequences, we know one of them converges. We're like, hey, I'm not sure about this one. Limit comparison test. So we know one of them converges. So if we do this test and we get the fact that the limit is, exists and is greater than zero, and one of them converges, we know, that was a little too loud, sorry. <laughs> we know that the other one also converges. It's the limit comparison test. Little complicated, again, but all of these tests are relatively a little on this side because, again, we're comparing sequences, we're comparing all of these terms, right? So hopefully that made sense. I think that did, right? Let me know if I messed up anything. I think that explanation was okay, right, Parker? I yeah, got I the nod. So. I got the nod. Um, I'm okay with the nod. <laughs> I'm okay with the nod. So the next so test LCT, is one of them. the yeah. basic comparison test, which is another I think the first one that you yeah. learn usually. I think um, yes, I so saw this now that it's before LCT. I probably should have just started with that, but you can yeah, maybe you can take over BCT. Yeah. So the basic comparison test is very intuitive and essentially all you're doing is you're finding another sequence so you have a you have a like a weird sequence that you're trying to test the convergence of and what you do is you have like reference points so you have simple sequences that you know the convergence of and you compare them so the only thing you need to know is which one is greater than which mm -hmm. So let's say you have two sequences. The sequence you're looking for is bigger than a sequence you know. And the sequence you know, actually, when you sum up all the terms, diverges. So automatically, this means that the sequence you're looking for, or sorry, the series you're looking for, also diverges. Because if every term is bigger, then you're summing up more <laughs> than something that already diverges the same thing goes for convergence series so if you have a sequence that you know converges and a sequence that you're looking for uh that you're looking for the the, the value of the series right or the convergence of the series and it's the 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 sequence is always less than the one that you already know therefore the one you're looking for is also convergent because you're going to be adding less together than something you already know converges. So that's the basic comparison test. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing goes for, um, oh, no, wait, I think, I think those are all the cases. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you covered them. Continuing on to different tests to test these things. Uh, Parker, you brought up the alternating series. And that is a common, common series that you see, right? When you have the negative plus, negative plus. So you always, you basically have plus minus. So your signs are alternating. And in this scenario, as you very well explained, you basically just stick that minus one to the power of n there, depending on if the first term is positive or not, of course, It'll be n, n plus one, whatever. And you're basically just adding them up. Now, for such an example, when we have minus one to the n, there are a lot of problems because you can't do anything with that. You can't really change that because it's always going to be alternating. So what do you do? You hmm. use the alternating series test. Very simple. 
The alternating series test basically takes that minus one, removes it, and does something with the rest. Puts it and, in the trash. And puts it in the trash, right? And whatever's remaining, we're basically testing that. So, let's so hope this makes sense. Oh, oh, by the way, a lot of these tests, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, all of these tests require... Do they require, because A has to be greater than zero, right? Like all of them have to be like, right? They all have to be positive. Am, for, I, am I right? For some of them. Not for all some of them. them. Yeah. So, okay. So again, because we've just been kind of explaining oh, yeah. It, I guess we didn't really mention. Exactly. We've messed. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Whoops. So we've been kind of going very calmly in this explanation and haven't d done a lot of the rigorousness with the mathematics. Like, oh, the function should be technically from A to infinity. Like I didn't mention that. Has to be positive increasing. I didn't mention so there are these small stipulations that obviously we're not mentioning just to keep the conversation kind of light, even though we are talking about a complicated scenario. But again, not getting into rigorous math because that would deter, deter it quite a lot, right? So again, if you want to know more about any of these things, a very quick Google search would answer your questions. But again, this hopefully just gets that fundamental, just that foundation down for you, hopefully. Right, anyway, so let's get to that alternating series test. So we have a series, we take out that minus one, throw it in the trash, and what we do is we test for three things. We see number one, are these elements greater than zero? That's our number one, right? If all of them are greater than zero, we then test, okay, is this sequence, I've remember, I've moved, the min I've removed the minus one, is this sequence decreasing? Now this theory, I mean not theory, this test only applies when this sequence that once taken out the minus one is decreasing, right? And again, all these tests have particular uh, particular elements of them. So like for example, and this is where a lot of these tests become useful. There is no restriction to the number of tests you can use on any particular sequence, right? So if let's say you have some prior knowledge of another sequence and you have some knowledge of this sequence, you can use multiple tests. You can use the BCT, and you can use the alternating series, or you can use the LCT and all, or whatever, right? The idea being that you can use multiple tests to test for this. And this is just a one particular scenario. So in this particular scenario, BN, or our sequence, removing the minus one, must be decreasing. And the final, third, last thing is that, as Parker, as you mentioned, and this is a categorical, this has to be true, the limit of the sequence itself is zero. This is true for any series that converges, right? Because otherwise, as you very well explained, you're just adding finite numbers forever. So that's, that's just not going to work. And if all of these three uh, tests or if all of these three conditions hold, then we can say that the alternating series is convergent. Now, again, the math is there. It's all there. We're just going through it just to get just that foundation down. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's another type of test. There is also the integral test, but I was reading it and I'm like, it's quite specific. Yeah, you know what I mean. So you yeah. can kind of use BCT LCT in there as well. So we don't yeah. really have to go over that. But uh, any other tests or anything that we're missing? Anything uh, we want to get? There is the ratio test, but I think that one's a little bit complicated to explain. <laughs> yeah, um, it's all about how you, like visual aid also helps. But yeah, again, sure. this is a podcast, right? So we are trying to. Uh, we are trying to keep it like that, right? So I think that's uh, about everything, to be honest. Let us know if you have any questions mm -hmm. on sequences or series. Also, let us know if you have any recommendations for things that you want us to talk about because we don't have ideas. So please send us some <laughs> ideas. I love that. We just don't have ideas. I mean, <laughs> no, we are always loving loving people when they send us ideas right because we 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 get fueled by ideas right the more ideas we have the more we can put down the more stuff for the future right so we would love ideas and i would highly recommend if you do have instagram to use instagram if you want to send us an idea because even though we do read our emails i don't know we're just lazy man. we just don't reply to them sometimes <laughs> like our instagram is just a text on our phone Emails, sometimes we have to sit down, think about them because they're long and thought out, right? So that's good. We love them. We love receiving them, continue, but it's just that it, it, it takes longer. So if you do have a suggestion or if you want to add anything, anything like that, make sure to DM us, mathophysics.podcast, because that's usually our quickest way to respond. All yeah. right. So I guess that's everything we had to say. 
please leave a follow mm. wherever you're listening to this, whether it be Spotify, Google Play, or YouTube. Uh, make sure to subscribe and leave a comment and leave a like. We didn't do types of series though. I think we should make a. I think we should no. I think we should make a set. I would definitely make a part yeah, two. Yeah, sure. Because we definitely need a part two where we talk about that test. The ratio test is a fundamental test, and then talking about power series, Taylor series, McLaren series, different geometric. types of these geometric series sequ even sequences there so we can maybe dive a little bit deeper into a part two this yeah we didn't cover everything we never do in a part one of any episode we never cover everything we just got those basics down so hopefully that made sense and as you very well said hit us up anywhere you want comment leave a comment on youtube leave that like smash that button and yeah that's All the right. episode this has been episode number 73 of the math and physics podcast I am your host, Parker. And I am Ray. And we will see you soon. Bye, guys.